I'm proud of y'all for responding this week. I'm proud of you for leaning in to what God has for you. Not taking a passive posture to the Holy Spirit, but taking an active posture where you're seeking to engage. The Bible says that when we seek God, guess what happens? What happens? We find God. The Bible says when we draw near to God, guess what happens? God draws near to us. Here is the convicting truth is that we don't find God because we're not seeking Him that much. And God isn't drawing near because honestly we have a passive posture towards the Almighty. Right? We're kind of kicking back and God knows my address. He can come drag me off the couch if He wants me to do something type of mentality. I'm proud of y'all for having an active part in your own spiritual growth and taking away all excuses this week. And I'm going to ask you to do so one more time tonight. Some of you have been holding back. Some of you have been on the edge and you've wanted to and your heart's been beating fast and God's been knocking. He's been knocking all week and you've been resisting. And tonight's your night for you to step out of the crowd and into the story that God wants to write in and through your life. Let me go ahead and make an announcement because I know the Holy Spirit is going to be thick at the end tonight. I'm already, I'm already believing that. That in just 40 minutes, you know, when we're singing again, that it's going to be a game-changing night for many of you. So it's not going to be conducive to make announcements in that, in that moment where lives are being changed and your eternity is shifting. So at, right after our worship tonight, those of you that are thinking about a call to ministry leadership, there's going to be a pastor of ministry, a panel of ministry leaders in the um, dining hall. So go ahead and put that in your mind. Those of you that are thinking about it, man, you might be uh, sixth grade. You might be seventh grade, but you kind of have this, you might be in high school and there's something on the back burner. You don't have to have this solid, hey man, God, you don't, we, we rarely see the staircase. He just reveals the next step. And so for some of you, the next step is going to that meeting and just exploring. You're not making a commitment. There's no chisel and hammer, right? You're not etching anything in stone. Just go check it out and explore it right after worship tonight. Also, for those of you that have made decisions this week, and for leaders in particular, listen, uh, get the card filled out because we want to follow up, right? It's not, that we, it, it's not that we're counting numbers to report, right? We want other people to rejoice in what God is doing in your life and what he's done this week. But primarily, we want to be sure that we provide you with the encouragement and support that you're going to need, right? New Christians are spiritual infants. You think an infant can uh, do very much for themselves? <laughs> They're going to need some help, right? If I were to throw a T-bone down in front of a one-year-old, I don't care how good the steak is cooked, he ain't going to be able to, to ingest it, <laughs> right? We need, we, for a season, you're going to need some help as you grow in your faith, and that's what that card is for. So leaders, please be sure to get that, those uh, info cards, decision cards turned in. Now tonight, I really want you to tune in, right? I, I want us to leave it all on the field, but this is our last night together. So tonight we're going to empty the tank. No reserves. We're going to push in with all we have left and we're going to leave it all on the field so that when you drive away tomorrow, you'll know that you did everything you humanly could to connect with Christ. That as much as it depended on you, you leaned in as hard as you could. You engaged as much as you could. And so we're going to empty the tank. Turn to the person beside you and say, empty the tank. <laughs> Leave it all on the field tonight. Some of you, listen up. Some of you are almost Christian. Think about that for a moment. Some of you are almost Christian. There was a study that was done in 2010, and it was the largest survey that was ever conducted on the religious life of teenagers in America. And a youth ministry professor at Princeton University wrote a book based upon the findings of that research. And the title of the book was this, Almost Christian. And here is the tragedy. 
is that these are religious teenagers. These are teenagers that come through our vacation Bible schools. These are teenagers that come through our children's ministry, our Awana's programs. These are teenagers that come to youth ministry and they're there on Wednesday night. These are teenagers that go to Disciple Nows. These are teenagers that come to Camp Siloam. These are teenagers just like some of you. And they did an exit interview on the back end of all of that religious experience. And here's the tragedy is that they somehow, in the midst of all the religiosity, they missed the main point. How in the world can you miss the gospel in the middle of so much religious activity? But that's what was happening. And she said they were almost Christian. When they asked them this question, on the, on the exit interview, they're coming out of our, our um, engaging, entertaining children's ministries, our high-powered, high-impact youth ministries, and they ask them as they're going on to the next chapter of their life, what does it mean to be a Christian? Do you th what do you think most of them, how, how, how did most of them respond? Think about that. How would you respond? What does it mean to be a Christian? And the tragedy is this, is that somehow they missed the gospel. A hundred quiet times, 500 quiet times, 500 youth services, high impact, high energy, entertaining, engaging, relevant. How many youth camps did they go to? And they come out the other side and they say this, the first response that many of them had was this, to be a good person. Whoa! That ain't the gospel. If that's how you would respond to that question, then you're wrong. And that's not John saying so. That's God saying so through his word. Actually, it's the opposite. It's the antithesis. What does it mean to be a Christian? We couldn't be good. Therefore, God sent his son. We couldn't climb the mountain to get to God. So God came down to the mountain to us in the form of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. But you know what they can't, they also said this. You know, what does being a Christian mean? Being a Christian means being nice. God forgive us. God forgive me as one who has been a part of downloading this false gospel into the lives of the next generation that we have so domesticated Jesus that after years of religious training, our students walk out and we ask them the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? And they say, be polite. Say yes, sir, and no, ma'am. Whoa. Time out. So we need to hit the pause button and rethink how we're training, how, we, how we're communicating the gospel. Here's just a side note and a, a word for me and a word for the adult leaders in the room. The author, the Princeton professor of youth ministry said this, the religiosity of American teenagers must be read primarily, listen, as a reflection of their parents' religious devotion or lack thereof. By extension, that of their congregations. Listen now. Um, a lot of the older generation likes to point at the youth ministry and say, y'all need to do a better job of connecting with these teenagers. You need to, you know, do something different. Be more relevant. You know, fill the room up with bodies. That's what she says here. Lackadaisical faith is not young people's issue. It's ours. The solution lies not in beefing up congregational youth programs or making worship more cool and trendy, listen, but in modeling the kind of mature, passionate faith we say we want our young people to have. Yeah. Oh, can we just stop there? As a dad of two youth, that hits the bullseye. That hits the bullseye. And so really fanning the flame of the passion of those that have the most influence in the lives of our youth and modeling it for them. Let me clarify a point. Turning your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. It's critical that we get the gospel right. And it's layers to the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 2, we'll begin in verse 8. This is a familiar passage for those that have been in church a little while. For it is by grace, say grace. Yes. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. Say faith. Yes. 
And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Say gift. Gift. Not by work so that no one can boast. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Write that down in the front of your Bible. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I want you to memorize that. This is a mantra. This is a gospel mantra. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The reformers added two more. The word of God alone, glory to God alone. The five solas of the Reformation. But for tonight's purposes, I want to drill this in. I want you, I want to push this in to your life. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Because what many, what some of you have, what many in the church have, especially within the youth ministry, but as, as I just said, it's a reflection of the older generations. They're reflecting what we're modeling. She said that the religion, the primary religion of most teenagers in America is something called moralistic therapeutic deism. Oh, man. Try to repeat that. Bam. <laughs> yeah, I'm right here, man. He's tuned in on the front row. Moralistic therapeutic deism, which basically means good people go to heaven when they die. That is not the gospel, by the way. Some of y'all think that's the gospel. Right, some of y'all are like, yeah, and? <laughs> that's not an amen point, right? <laughs> Good people go to heaven when they die. Oh, hallelujah. No. Oh. That's a false gospel. That's a work-based gospel. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's critical that we get this right. And this is the prerequisite for verse 10. But we can't stop reading at verse 9. It's by grace we're saved through faith. And this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Then we go on to verse 10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, listen, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So it's critical that we get the order right. Some of us have verse 10 before verse 8, and so we think that we are earning God's favor through our good works, and that's not the case. Right? You're not, you're not spiritually training. You're not breaking a spiritual sweat to earn your place on God's team. It's because we're already on the team that we train hard. Verse 8 and 9 have to come before verse 10. But listen, verse 10, always, say always, always, always follows verses 8 and 9. Faith without fruit is flatlined. That's a paraphrase of James chapter 2. Faith without deeds is dead. Faith without action is lifeless, is useless, is pointless. So verse 10, so we're not saved by works, but because we're saved, we do good works. So if, you're not, if your life has not been impacted by the gospel, if amazing grace hasn't transformed you and isn't transforming you, then you have to ask some more fundamental questions and do some soul searching tonight. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, however, works always follow grace. Listen to that. That's a strong statement. Works always follow authentic grace. Tim Keller, he's a pretty solid dude. <laughs> He says this, the gospel is not about something we do, but what has been done for us. And yet the gospel results in a whole new way of life. This grace and the good deeds that result must be both distinguished and connected. The gospel, its results, and its implications must be carefully related to each other. One of Martin Luther's mantras was that we are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that remains alone. His point is that the true gospel belief will always and necessarily lead to good works. So we have to get this right. This is the gospel. This is the main course. This is the, the point of everything. 
that we do. If we do all the other stuff and check the boxes and jump through the hoops and go through the motions, but we somehow miss the main thing, wow. God help us. Tonight I want to talk about the gospel, the main thing. Every Christian has a testimony, and every testimony has the same source. A testimony is an automatic result of truly embracing the gospel. A testimony is a byproduct of amazing grace. Let me ask you something. Do you have a testimony? I wish I could sit with every one of you and hear your story. I wish, I really do, as a pastor, and I know the people that are here with you, that would love to hear your story. Hopefully, I've already heard many of your stories. I would love to hear your story. Some of y'all, though, here's the false thinking that we've created somehow, is that some of y'all think, I don't have a testimony. If you're a Christian, you have a testimony. It's an automatic result of the gospel. A testimony is a byproduct of grace. The details of our stories are going to be radically different, but the source is the same. It's the gospel. It's the same salvation, the same cross, the same Jesus, the same spirit. This is the gospel. Gospel comes from an old English word, an Anglo-Saxon word, which means good story. Originally in the New Testament, the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke, the gospel of John, the gospel of the kingdom. It's used all over the New Testament. The Greek word is euangelion. Say euangelion. There you go. You know some Greek now. Which means good news. Good news. The gospel is like a morsel of food to a starving person. The, that's great news, man. If you're starving, if you're in the desert and you're parched and you're about to die of dehydration, the gospel is like a cup of refreshing water. The gospel is freedom, liberty to those that have been held captive and in bondage. That's the gospel. It's good news. The gospel is the engine that fuels our sanctification. Say that word, sanctification. sanctification. How many of y'all know what that word means? Somebody tell me what that word means, sanctification. What was it back here? constant growth. I like that. That's a good definition. It's growing in godliness. It's what we talked about last night for 40 minutes. It's, it's becoming more like Jesus. The gospel is the engine that fuels our sanctification and the Holy Spirit is the fuel. So if you have an awesome vehicle, if you have this amazing vehicle and on the outside it looks awesome, but there is no engine. What, what's the point? And that's, the, that's a picture of some of y'all's faith tonight. Well, what if you have an engine in it, but the tank is empty? There is no gas. You're not going to go anywhere. What's the point of having a vehicle if it's not going to take you from A to B, if it's not going to advance you down the road? Jesus on the cross absorbing God's wrath. You want to peel back the layers of the gospel and what it really means? Here's a big word, propitiation. Say that, propitiation. propitiation. There you go. I dare you to use that word in a sentence this week. <laughs> just with your friends, just text it to them. You know what propitiation... <laughs> I can't even say it, man. It's a theological word, though, and it is a, it is a key ingredient of the gospel. Now you have these, these words like justification and atonement and regeneration and propitiation that unfortunately have been hijacked by the ivory tower theologians and it wasn't that long ago when everyday Christians knew what these words meant. Propitiation is Jesus. This is the gospel. Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's suffocating. He's got spikes through his wrist and through his ankles and Jesus looks up to heaven and says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a mind-blowing, incomprehensible statement when you think of who Jesus is, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, that remember this phrase, were eternally preexistent. 
And so for Jesus hanging on the cross saying, Father, Father, why have you abandoned me? In that moment, God the Father opened up the floodgates of heaven and poured out on his son the judgment, the wrath, the condemnation for every, every sin that has ever been committed from Eve reaching towards the forbidden fruit to the final sin on the last day. Jesus paid it all. So he's hanging on the cross under the Niagara Falls of the wrath of his father. And he's absorbing and he's consuming it. And he consumes every drop of the wrath of the Almighty. He receives our judgment. And this is, this is the grace and faith in Christ. This is what was accomplished. This is propitiation where Jesus receives our punishment and we receive his righteousness. That's how dirty, broken people can ever have a chance of being in the presence of the triple holy God without being vaporized. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The imputed, the transferred righteousness of Jesus. This is the heartbeat of the gospel. We never graduate from it. Some of y'all think, the gospel, wasn't that something I learned in like vacation Bible school? Some of y'all think the gospel is like a kiddie pool. And biblically, the gospel is the ocean. As a matter of fact, it's deeper than the ocean. It's a bottomless well. We never reach the bottom of the gospel. We never outgrow the gospel. We never graduate from the gospel. As a matter of fact, it's absolutely essential for us as Christians to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day by grace alone, through faith alone. In Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as we stumble and as we fall forward down the narrow way, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I am training not to earn God's favor or to prove my worth. I am training in the shadow of the cross and I am training out in front of the empty tomb. The gospel is the engine. The Holy Spirit is the fuel. We all have the same basic testimony. The gospel is the main ingredient of every testimony of all time. So we have the same testimony as the Apostle Paul. We have the same testimony as the early church fathers. You have the same testimony as the Christians that went to the Colosseum in Rome. You have the same testimony right now as Christians that are in China, in Africa, and all over the world. And if the Lord tarries, you will have the same testimony as your great-great-grandkids if they become Christians. It's the same. It's a universal component of every Christian testimony. Jesus is the main character of every testimony. The gospel testimony is this. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but now I live. I was headed to hell, but now I'm headed to heaven. The details might be radically different, but let me tell you, you have a testimony. Some of y'all were saved when you were seven years old, eight years old, nine years old. So you hear testimonies about these people that were slinging drugs and beating up old ladies. And you think, man... I don't have a testimony. Yes, you do. The details are different, but the main ingredient is the same. Right? It's different flavors, but it's the same ice cream. You were under God's wrath. Now you are in Christ. Now you are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You were spiritually dead. Now you're spiritually alive. You were spiritually blind. Now you can spiritually see. You were headed to hell, and now you are headed to heaven. That's your testimony. That's powerful. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be embarrassed by it. Proclaim it. The Apostle Paul knew firsthand the soul-cleansing, life-changing power of grace. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul gets autobiographical here. And he says, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Listen. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Basically what that means is he was headed to hell. A blasphemer means he was headed to hell. 
I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace, say grace. The grace of our Lord poured out on me abundantly. And in the language of the Bible, that is super strong language. It's very emphatic. The super abundant grace of God. The grace upon the grace upon the grace. That's what he's saying. The super abundant grace of God was unleashed on my life. Along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Pause. The Apostle Paul was in his early 60s when he wrote this letter. He's not far from, he's already done incredible things for the Lord. But notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, I was a sinner. He says, I am a sinner, present tense. He never outgrew his need for grace. He never graduated from God, the gospel. He goes on to say, but for this very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Then after he, he's thinking about his testimony, he's thinking about the gospel, he's thinking about, man, the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9, he's thinking about, man, I was blind, literally, for him, and now I see. I was under God's wrath, and now the light bulb went off, and now I am in the righteousness of Christ. In verse 17, after he thinks about that, he just erupts into praise. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Apostle Paul never got over getting saved. And neither should we. Sixty-something years old, and the brother's still fired up. <laughs> his faith is contagious. The fire in his heart burns hot. The Apostle Paul knew firsthand the soul-cleansing, life-changing power of the gospel. I know firsthand the soul-cleansing, life-changing power of the gospel. The grace, the amazing grace of God is not some theological concept that I learned in a classroom. I experienced the soul-cleansing, life-changing grace of Jesus on the worst possible day of my life. Listen, students, I would have called myself a Christian long before I actually met Christ. I was almost Christian. Good old boy religiosity. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you, I'm describing your current state. I pray that God will step you out of that tonight, will pull you out of that delusion tonight. And you'll have not just theoretical grace, but experiential grace. Not just theological grace, but a grace that actually changes how you live. This good old boy religiosity, cornbread eating, football playing, four wheel driving, squirrel killing, sweet tea drinking, camo wearing dude. You know what I'm talking about, right? Going to VBS as a kid, learning the Bible stories, prayed before meals and before bedtime. I learned the Lord's Prayer in a locker room. That's how we roll in the Bible Belt. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking. Before the games, some of y'all might still do, do, still do this. We'd grab a knee in the locker room, and I, I partied with these guys that I played football with, right? And it, looking back on it, it's bizarre that we would grab a knee, grab hands, our Father who art in heaven. We even learned it in the King James, which is next level. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. And the, the, the intensity would, would amp up. Because, man, the band's playing. I can smell the popcorn, right? We, man, we got the full pads on. We're about to bust through the sign. For thine is the power and the glory forever. Then we bust through the sign. And then some youth pastor or some pastor prays over the intercom for both teams. This religiosity, this churchianity. I heard the gospel, but I never got the gospel. And some of y'all tonight, I'm talking to you, right? You know who you are. I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to be like a spotlight. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. Test us and know our thoughts. 
Mark chapter 7, Jesus calls out some religiosity. He deconstructs some churchianity. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Who's he talking to? He's talking to super religious people. He's talking to people that memorize the book of Deuteronomy. That's pretty impressive. I salute you, Pharisee. You know, we're, we're chest bumping when we, when we get John 3.16 down. These brothers had the book of Deuteronomy memorized. And Jesus says, you don't get it. It's not about what's up here. It's about what's in here. You confess me with your lips, but your life is far from it. Your heart has remained untouched. Therefore, your life remains unchanged. Matthew chapter 23. Again, he drops the hammer down. You religious people, you hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you're full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You snakes, you vipers, how will you escape the fire of hell? <laughs> I'm offended. I'm offended by what Jesus just said. And he's talking to super religious people. He's talking to the ones that had all the gold stars. He's talking to the ones that had all the patches on their jacket, all the trophies in the case. Jesus is deconstructing their religiosity and demolishing their churchianity. And a part of my mission tonight, listen, lean in. A part of my mission tonight is to demolish your churchianity and to destroy your religiosity. I'm talking to you, listen students, I'm talking to you like I wish someone had to talk to me when I was your age. To grab you by the shoulders and look you in the eyes and as best as I can to tell you that it's real. This is not some fairy tale that somebody made up to make folks feel better at funerals. This is not just some club for the nerds and the, out and the outcast. The Bible is true. The gospel is true. Jesus is alive. Yeah. Hell is real. Heaven's real. To talk to you like I wish somebody had to talk to me, it took a tragedy for God to get my attention. And the short version is that I, 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 I was almost Christian. Listen, I prayed the prayer when I was 16 years old. I got baptized. But no one could tell around me. So if you pray a prayer and those closest to you don't notice a difference, then you have to question the authenticity of your prayer. The Bible says if any person be in Christ Jesus, if any person is really connected to God, if the God that spoke creation into existence takes up residence in your life, things are going to change. Things will change. When the light, when the light switch gets flipped on, you're going to be illuminated. The Bible says if anybody is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And so I was almost Christian. But yet I still go out on the weekends and party with my friends. You know what I'm talking about. You go to church on Sunday and your breath still smells like what you drank on Saturday night. You know what I'm talking about. I was Christian. The dudes I partied with, the girls that I dated, they were Christian. The guys that I fought on the weekends, we'd fight pretty regularly. They were Christians too. And looking back on it, man, just the, the tragedy, the delusion that we were under, this false assurance based upon some words that we had said that, we, that I thought that I was good to go with God because I got wet. Because I got baptized. And even some of us wear crosses around our neck. And it was, a, it was a fashion accessory. It wasn't a statement of authentic faith. And even some weekends when you, when you go too far and you vomit. And I'm dragging the cross of Jesus through the vomit of my life. And some of you tonight are doing the exact same thing. And you're playing this game. And you think you can have one foot in each world. You think you can straddle the fence. And that's not what the Bible says. Choose you this day who you will serve. If it's God, then be all in. 
It's Revelations 3 from last night. I beg you to be one or the other, but if you're lukewarm, you're going to get vomited out of it. You make God sick to his stomach. After I graduated, we were out at a party one night, and I'd done something. This is something we'd done a hundred times before. And I'm cruising towards town looking for a fight, and we were out in the woods, had a keg of beer, and we're just, just raising hell, to be honest. Small town. Friday night, what else are you going to do? What else is there to do? Last memory is cruising in my Z71, going towards town. I got my whole life in front of me. I'm 18 years old, and I'm invincible. Some of you dudes know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm 18 years old, and I'm strong, and I'm bulletproof, and I'm going to live forever. Memory comes back in. I'm in a stranger's truck. I have no idea what just happened. Take me to my house, my mom and my dad. Take me back out to where the party was, and nobody knows what happened. I was drinking. I was driving. And I, to this day, I still don't know what exactly happened. There's a blank spot in my memory. But I missed a curve, went off the road. I got thrown out the driver's side window. My cousin, Jeremy Russell, was killed. 16 years old. And here I am, 18 years old. And it doesn't happen to people like us. Stuff like this doesn't happen to people like us. The guy in the middle, Ryan Smith, August the 13th, that was his 18th birthday. And he was busted up so bad. They landed a chopper on Highway 24 between Camden and Chester, and they medevaced him to Little Rock. And thank the Lord, after sur many surgeries, he, he recovered. But my cousin was killed. And everything, listen, students, this false gospel, this almost Christian, this mediocre, lukewarm, it was destroyed. And I was falling in the darkness and I had nothing there to catch me. All the things I had been living for. My reputation. You know, how many tomahawks were on the back of my helmet? All conference player, whatever. All the things I had been living for. What kind of vehicle I was driving. Who I hung out with. What was going on next Friday and Saturday night. All the things that consumed my life in a fraction of a second meant absolutely nothing. They offered me no comfort. And the very voice, the very voice that tempted me to take the bait, once they set the hook, now that same voice was screaming in my mind, look what you've done. God will never accept you. The same voice that seduced me to jump the fence, that, that made me think I was missing the party, that I was missing the fun, that the grass was greener. The same voice that tempted me to take the bait is now the voice that's holding my, my soul underwater, suffocating me in guilt and condemnation. I didn't want to be alive. I didn't want to live. It should have been me. I was driving the truck. Why was my cousin killed and I'm alive? And I was angry, but the anger eroded into desperation. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And that's when Jesus found me. That's when Jesus found me. Jesus reached shoulder deep into the ditch and he saved me. And he saved me and I still haven't gotten over getting saved. It took a tragedy for God to get my attention and my hope in sharing my story is that it won't take a tragedy for God to get yours. Wisdom is not learning from your own mistakes. It's learning from the mistakes of others. Don't take the bait. Don't believe the lie. 